Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Binu Santhu. Let's take a look at the stories for the day. This is GE Vernova, helping generate and move the energy that will change the world. Welcome to a new era of energy. Till September this year, financial creditors have recovered about 33% of the claims in 553 corporate insolvency processes that ended up getting resolved. Is this a sign that India's insolvency process has turned the corner? The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India recently revealed that financial creditors have recovered 32.95% of their claims in 553 corporate insolvency processes or CIRPs that were resolved till September 2022. This uptick in the recovery for creditors from the resolution of stressed assets under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code or IBC comes after two disappointing quarters. The recovery had hit a record low of 10.2% in the March quarter and 10.7% in the June quarter. The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of 2016 was enacted to provide for the insolvency resolution of distressed entities in a time-bound manner. The main objective of the Code is to rescue corporate debtors in distress. A total of 5,893 CIRPs have commenced by the end of September 2022. Of these, 3,946 have been closed. And amongst the closed cases, 2,139 cases or 54% have been rescued, while 46% or 1,807 corporate debtors were sent for liquidation. The IBC has rescued 553 corporate debtors through resolution plans, 846 through appeal or review or settlement, and 740 through withdrawal. The resolved corporate debtors had assets valued at 1.37 trillion rupees, while the corporate debtors referred for liquidation had assets valued at 0.6 trillion rupees when they were admitted to CIRP. Thus, in value terms, around 70% of distressed assets were resolved. Experts believe that the uptick in the recovery for financial claims is symptomatic of the several timely amendments made to the code by the regulator and the government. Uh, for instance, um, there has uh, the regulations have been amended to allow part sale of assets in a resolution plan if no resolution plan for the entire company has has been received. And this is being done with a with a view to achieve value maximization and to make sure that some value is accrued to the stakeholders. Uh, also, uh, there have been amendments to ensure that uh, even base timelines are envisaged uh, for running the CIP process so that resolution professionals who are running the entire process knows exactly what timelines within the 180 uh, period day period needs to be adhered to. Uh, recently, insolvency professional entities uh, have been allowed to act as resolution professionals to afford more, uh, you know, solidity to the entire process. Uh, so those are the positive measures which the regulators have been taking. However, even as the recovery rate increases, experts on the code agree that excessive delays, often more than two to three years, and the loss of value in the resolution process are major challenges to overcome. Uh, delays are happening in terms of admission of the situations. Uh, delays are happening once the committee of creditor approves the case in NCLD. Uh, I think uh, some of uh, some of the things IBBI is doing very well by uh, pushing government to increase bench strength in various uh, other aspects where uh, uh, introduction of say information utility, uh, trying to see how uh, the delay can be cut down. However, the time taken between say a month to say sometimes a two years can really kill the company. Delays aren't the only challenges to overcome. 
The second issue, which perhaps going forward can be considered, uh, is how to deal with real estate insolvency. Uh, real estate insolvency, as you know, uh, includes a lot of home buyers as well. And that has become quite a sensitive issue considering the interest of home buyers. So therefore, uh, you know, how one deals with the real estate insolvency, should there be a project specific insolvency or the entire company should go into insolvency altogether. Cross-border insolvency, of course, the enabling provisions under, under the code have already been, uh, you know, notified. But how it is to be implemented exactly is uh, is not done yet. Chandak believes the appointment of a provisional interim resolution professional can help with the delays. So if uh, some professional is appointed immediately on the reference itself, uh, so I think in the liquidation parlance in the Companies Act, there used to be a concept called provisional liquidator. So something of that uh, aspect can be introduced in insolvency where a provisional uh, IRP interim resolution professional can be appointed. And once the uh, NCLT is satisfied, he can be termed as a permanent resolution professional. Amendments also need to be brought in to help with the smooth functioning of the National Company Law Tribunal. Uh, sometimes NCLT could take a uh, lot of time in deciding on those matters. So there can be some deemed provisions where you can say that, okay, if uh, in say 15 days or a month, if decision is not taken, then it will be assumed that resolution plan has been approved uh, by NCLT. Uh, the third thing could be, uh, uh, I think NCLT needs to use, uh, uh, I think, technology a lot more so that decisions can, orders and decisions can be uh, communicated maybe uh, by the end of the day or by the next day, while sometimes after pronouncement, it can take a couple of weeks. Uh, after the uh, order is reserved, it can take a couple of months to even pronounce the order. So that is really taking a lot of toll on some of these stress companies. Clearly, India's insolvency processes are on a road to maturity. The timely amendments made to the code, as well as the initiative taken by the regulator, have clearly borne fruit. However, challenges still persist and it is to be seen how the IBBI deals with these in the coming financial quarters. India is turning the corner in defense equipment manufacturing as well. Prime Minister Narendra Modi recently said that the country's defense exports have shot up eight times since 2014. Defense Minister Rajnath Singh has now set an ambitious target to attain another threefold jump in defense exports from FY 2022 numbers. And the early signs are good. In January, India signed a deal to arm the Philippines with the BrahMos cruise missiles in what was New Delhi's largest ever weapons sale abroad. And recently, an Indian private sector company clinched an Armenian contract to supply advanced artillery guns. So have we finally laid the ghost of Bofors to rest? This India-made 155mm, 39 caliber truck-mounted howitzer will soon help Armenia defend its borders. Pune-based Bharat Forge has clinched a big export order from the European country to supply these guns, at the price that Bharat Forge has divulged. The Armenian order will involve the purchase of 4-5 to five regiments of 155mm mounted gun systems. Each regiment consists of 18-20 to 20 guns. The total value of the order is $155.5 million or about 1,265 crore rupees. The deal is an unprecedented breakthrough since that's almost a tenth of the value of India's annual defence exports in the past year. 
India's animal defense exports have jumped over 740% between FY17 and FY22. In September, shortly after clashes between Armenia and Azerbaijan, India had signed a deal for the export of missiles, rockets, and ammunition, including its indigenous Pinaka multi barrel rocket launchers, to Armenia. While the government did not reveal the value of the contracts, reports said that India would supply weapons worth over 2,000 crore rupees to Armenia over the coming months. India's former foreign secretary and a senior fellow at the Center for Policy Research, Sham Saran, says that while deals like this, with Armenia are not part of some new phenomena, the scale is different from before. Saran adds that being able to support a country with a supply of modern weapons will increase India's external influence. He adds that India is looking at arms exports not only as a means of obtaining much-needed foreign exchange, but also as a means of increasing its geopolitical influence. He also pointed out that the viability of country's domestic defence industry is often dependent upon its ability to export. So for all those reasons, I think uh, this is uh, a trend which will probably uh, be more in evidence uh, as we go forward. But more than anything else, the Armenian artillery deal has laid the ghost of Bofors to rest and sent a clear signal that India can build this crucial instrument of war, dubbed the king of battle for its destructive power on its own. The last time that howitzers were brought by India was in 1986. After a lengthy trial period which involved several competitors, India chose to buy guns from Swedish arms manufacturer AB Bofors, and 410 Bofors guns were brought. It was also expected that over a thousand of them would be manufactured in India by the Ordnance Factory Board with transfer of technology from Bofors. But the entire deal got embroiled in controversy after allegations of bribery came out of Sweden. India didn't make any Bofors guns and the transfer of technology documents gathered dust. For years, the Indian army would remain desperately short of artillery. And nowhere was this absence felt so keenly as during the Kargil War in 1999. Eventually, the same old 155mm 39 caliber Bofors gun would play a crucial role in pounding Pakistani positions and helping the Indian army capture Kargil's dominating heights. One of the lessons to emerge from the war was that the Indian army needed more artillery, especially 155mm guns. At Kargil, the ranges at which the Indian army was shooting were beyond the capability of 105mm guns that were the standard field artillery piece at the time. So 14 years after the Bofors deal, India again started conducting trials to buy advanced artillery guns. And the companies that participated were the who's who of the artillery world at the time. By then, Bofors had been sold to BAE Systems, a British company. BAE Systems thought it could participate in those trials without the stigma of the Bofors scandal. And each time a trial was held, the gun that would be selected was the BAE Systems Bofors gun. The Indian politician is a canny beast. Uh, he realized that uh, if that gun is bought by India, uh, the opposition will waste no time in uh, kicking up a, a sort of a controversy uh, over the the repurchase of the Bofors gun and you know, uh, with all its att attendant drawbacks. Uh, so uh, each time they would hold a trial, the BAE Systems gun would come out uh, tops in the trial, uh, and then they would find some reason to cancel the trial and restart the whole process once again. So that happened three or four times. While attempts to import such systems failed, the Ordnance Factory Board redesigned the Bofors gun, upgunning it to 45 caliber weapon based on the original transfer of technology documents. The new gun is called the Dhanush and an order for 145 guns has already been placed. The DRDO too started developing a larger, more powerful version of the Bofors called the Advanced Stored Artillery Gun System or ATAGS. It has been developed in partnership with Tata and Kalyani groups from the private sector. The guns are still in the process of trial and evaluation but are making good progress. The DRDO has also produced an offshoot of the ATAX called the Mounted Gun System or MGS. The Mounted Gun System is made up of the ATAX gun mounted onto a wheeled tractor from where it can be fired without lengthy preparations. The private sector has also stepped in. In particular, Bharat Forge is pursuing a number of artillery system programs in a very determined manner. It has even imported an entire gun factory from Austria and relocated it to Pune, where it has become part of its technology familiarization program. Another major private player, Tata Aerospace and Defense, is collaborating with DRDO on the ATACs. The Indian Army is also set to acquire an additional 100 K9 Vajra tracked self-propelled howitzers from Larsen and Tubro. 
155 mm 52 caliber Vajras are South Korean guns that are manufactured indigenously by LNT at its Gujarat facility under transfer of technology. There's a clear sense in the private sector, especially at Bharat Force, the Tata Group and Larson and Tubro that manufacturing artillery guns is an attractive financial proposition. So these are the, the, the largely the, the gun systems programs that are underway. And it is hoped that if all of them go through India, finally we'll have enough artillery to, to support operations, infantry operations all across the frontier. The sheer volume of explosives that can be placed on a target area by 155mm guns is something that cannot be achieved by any other system presently in service. At least for the immediate future, field artillery will continue to have its place in the modern battlefield. The Armenian deal is a clear indication of that. What remains to be seen is whether India will be able to replicate its export success in the field with other critical defence systems as well. told Business Standard that indigenization is boosting defence stocks but cautioned on possible consolidation in the near term. Meanwhile, equity markets now appear to have moved past worries of rate hikes. This is reflected by the Sensex and Nifty indices hovering near their all-time highs. As markets look to pick up pace, is it time to restructure your portfolio and add high beta stocks? Watch this report. After a strong turnaround from the year's lows, equity markets have swiftly reclaimed their one-year highs and are now in proximity to their all-time high levels. The Sensex and FT indices have gained around 17% each since July when the markets began moving north. Analysts expect this positive momentum to firmly sustain going forward and believe it is time to turn the market strategy away from defensive plays to sectors like banks and NBFCs. And with all the challenges from the global market, especially the inflation numbers which are now cooling down and very soon within two months down the line, we are expecting the interest rate cycle will also start to peak out. So given this kind of a scenario, market players have already started anticipating that there is going to again going to be a shift from a debt to equity at a global level. So India too will get certain share of foreign equity which was missing from quite a long time, the foreign growth. Domestic investors are definitely pushing a lot of money. All the margin related challenges and the pressures that we have seen in the coming quarter, it is likely to get mitigated by March quarter. And with a lot of capex activity which is going on in the market and with the banking sector now getting turned into positive side with a better credit environment, we definitely feel after two to three months down the line, markets will definitely start making new highs. And it's definitely more good time to get into a high beta stock where we can make very big money. On the bourses, banks and capital goods have seen a sharper run-up since July than healthcare and FMCG packs from the defensive category. While the BSE healthcare and FMCG indices have gained 16% and 9% respectively from July, the BSE bank X and capital goods indices have rallied 26% and 28% as compared to a 17% up move in the Sensex benchmark. A.K. Prabhakar of IDBI Capital prefers domestic bets over FMCG and pharma pockets, which are facing headwinds from weak ruler demand and high raw material prices. Because, you know, the market uh, momentum has totally changed. You know, it is more to do with banks, capital goods, you know, and uh, QSR, you know, and hotels, you know. So, sectors, you know, which are more domestic-led is doing very good. So, pharma is out of focus and, you know, FNCG due to the inflation pressure you know, and uh, rural stress, you know, there also I'm not too gungo about it. But uh, selectively, auto is also doing good. Like you see, you know, uh, commercial vehicles or passenger vehicles, they are doing good and auto ancillary is doing good. So, I, and defense related stock is one more sector which is doing good. 
so slightly restructuring your sector will be always better now so that you know you don't miss out on the opportunity which is there now the sectors that are set to take the lead in the next market rally will be banks and capital goods players according to analysts so as far as sectors goes at this point of time so definitely banking and financials are looking pretty good uh, because they are coming out from almost last four years of consolidation so last six months has been really good so all the data points are uh, showing us that yes this is one of the sector which will start taking a lead along with that there are lots of sectors into this cap goods engineering infrastructure oriented companies even for that matter cement companies also are likely to do good the fuel prices coming down for the cement companies and with lot of capex which has already been done by these companies in anticipation of better demand that's it markets will seek direction from their global counterparts today globally investors will also track existing home sales in the us and retail sales in the uk Stock markets certainly fall in the game of skill category where people with experience have a better chance of making money than the rookies. A debate around game of skill and game of chance has been raging for a while now. Our next report has more on that. On November 13, the Supreme Court upheld an order by the Punjab and Haryana High Court stating that fantasy sports are a game of skill and not chance. Over a year ago, in July 2021, a separate bench of the Apex Court had upheld the legality of fantasy sports. But how does a game of skill differ from a game of chance? A game of skill requires a player's expertise and mental or physical strength to win. It does not depend on luck. The players use several strategies to win the game. Usually, the player with better skills or expertise wins it. It also requires constant practice to improve chances of victory. In the game of chance, the win depends on luck. In online gaming, a sequence of random numbers is generated which decide the fate of the player. You may or may not win. Each player largely has the same chance of winning despite their experience or skill. These are easier to play than the games of skill as they do not require any technical knowledge. Lottery and roulette are some examples of such games. There are different laws and attitudes towards the two types of games in India. The winnings from games of skill attract 18% of goods and services tax. On the other hand, winnings from games of chance invites 28% GST. People have varied opinions on whether fantasy games should be categorized based on skill or luck. However, the Supreme Court has made it clear that it involves a certain skill level in playing these games. Online rummy, poker, and esports. have also been categorized as games of skills in india the debate around the issue has intensified in the last few months with the increase in the size of the industry by 2023 the sector's size is expected to reach 2 billion dollars and there are over 400 gaming startups in india in the uk gambling is legal as long as the provider is licensed under the gambling act of 2005 In the US there are specific legal standards for defining a game as a game of chance or skill. Despite the skill required, poker has been categorized as a game of skill in the country as it involves a level of randomness. In the EU, some countries like Malta allow games of all types, while others like Cyprus only permit betting, casino games and poker. trusted bank sbi the bank of to every indian before taking a call on the taxation of online gaming and betting the group of ministers looking into the matter should first come out with an unambiguous definition to clear the confusion and reduce the scope of more litigations a law panel of the gst council has said that's all for today for more news and analysis please log into our website www.business-standard.com and we'll also see you on monday morning thank you for watching
If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.